Hello and welcome to the webinar brought to you by the Kentucky Pollution Prevention Center located at the University of Louisville. I'm Melissa McCracken and will be serving as the facilitator for the session. Today's webinar is part of the Kentucky Sustainable Manufacturing Initiative training series and the objective is to explore developing a culture for innovation and sustainability and the KSMI, as we call it, has been um, doing a series of webinars and workshops to help with this educational outreach. So first, let me start by telling you a little bit about KPPC for those not familiar with us. KPPC is a university-based technical assistance program. Our services are free, confidential, and non-regulatory. The center provides training and technical assistance to business and industry as well as other organizations throughout Kentucky. We seek to help companies improve efficiency through waste minimization, water conservation, and energy management. And it's important to note, again, that we are provided at no cost, confidential, non-regulatory, and that's primarily through funding that we do receive through grants. Today's topic will focus on sustainable product development. The speakers are Mark Toda, a senior engineer with KPPC, and Dr. Jawahir with the Institute for Sustainable Manufacturers at the University of Kentucky. We'll try hard to stay on time and may have to cut off discussion to keep things moving. So let's go ahead and get started. At this time, I'd like to introduce Mark Toda, who will get us started off with a recap of KSMI. Yes, good morning everyone. Uh, my name again is Mark Tota with the with KPPC here at the University of Louisville and I'd like to introduce this um, webinar today by talking just for a few minutes about the Kentucky Sustainable Manufacturing Initiative uh, where we've come to at this point in time and then introducing the um, concept of sustainable product development. Uh, with the uh, Kentucky Sustainable Manufacturing Initiative, we uh, have completed a, a training series, uh, which was three webinars and three workshops that was completed here in uh, February of 2018. Uh, and uh, we de have developed a website, um, which is our KSMI uh, website, which the link is there for you to, to, um, to check out. Um, we have recorded uh, three webinars that are available on that uh, website and today's webinar and uh, a subsequent webinar which will be uh, occurring later this month will also be available on that website. Uh, KPPC is also providing uh, direct technical assistance to manufacturers here in Kentucky. Um, and again, our assistance is at no cost, it's non-regulatory and confidential. Um, and we will be providing direct assistance from our staff as well as connection to um, external resources um, that can assist you with sustainable manufacturing initiatives um, at your facility. I just wanted to recap the um, KSMI training series that we <clears throat> uh, have completed here. Uh, we s began back in November with an introduction to uh, sustainable manufacturing. Uh, Dr. Um, Jawa here from the University of Kentucky's Institute for Sustainable Manufacturing provided a, an overview of sustainable manufacturing uh, on that first webinar. Um, the first workshop really focused on evaluating the current state uh, and there in particular we talked about sustainable value stream mapping and Dr. Faslina Batterdeen provided a presentation uh, on sustainable value stream mapping there at that uh, workshop. Uh, Dr. Batterdeen is also with the Institute for Sustainable Manufacturing at the University of Kentucky. Uh, the workshop was held at GE Appliance Park and we had a tour of that facility. The next webinar uh, sort of laid the foundation of life cycle perspective or life cycle thinking and um, 
would be a help to manufacturers to uh, introduce life cycle perspective into their ISO 14001 um, plans and activities. Uh, workshop two, um, we actually um, didn't actually hold that workshop. Um, and then we moved on to um, workshop three, which was really developing a culture for innovation and sustainability. And we incorporated some of the topics from workshop two into this third module, which includes webinar three and workshop three. Um, but looking at um, uh, webinar three was actually developing a culture for innovation and sustainability. So we talked about that. The um, culture really um, utilizing a lot of the concepts from uh, lean manufacturing uh, in developing a culture for innovation and sustainability. We also included um, uh, an introduction to sustainable new product development um, and um, research that's ongoing at the University of Louisville in our third workshop, which was held at uh, the Ford Louisville Assembly Plant here in uh, Louisville. Uh, we heard presentations on uh, incorporating uh, sustainability into ISO 14001 plans uh, by the Smith Management Group. And we also heard a uh, very interesting presentation by Lexmark International from Lexington uh, regarding their sustainability initiatives um, there. So that brought us to this point. And the one piece that we, um, that we really felt needed more input and training was the area of sustainable new product development. And so that was really the main uh, purpose for today's uh, webinar. So I wanted to just briefly mention again the uh, KSMI website. Um, this is kind of a residual resource. These uh, resources will continue to be there uh, and available to manufacturers. Um, again, this is the website, uh, kppc.org forward slash KSMI. There's a primer uh, on sustainable manufacturing that is there uh, to read. There are some general, um, some general information and information on our training series is available on the website. The recordings of the KSMI webinars are available there for manufacturers to review. And there are um, several references and links to resources um, throughout the website. So please go to and visit that website for additional information moving forward. So um, <clears throat> that sort of ends uh, I, I ends this initial piece of it. I want to take just a few more minutes to talk a little bit about sustainable product development. The uh, cradle to grave sort of concept um, is uh, an op is a paradigm that manufacturers have worked in in the past um, where we take uh, materials, we make products, we use those products and then we dispose of them. Uh, this is kind of focused on making products, uh, getting products to the customer as quickly and as cheaply as possible. So kind of focusing on the economic part of the triple bottom line. Uh, that triple bottom line being uh, economy, um, environment and society. The problem is this cradle to grave is totally unsustainable. Um, and we're taking uh, materials from the uh, um, at you know from the biological cycle at an, an alarming rate, and I'm going to talk about that here in just a minute. Uh, we really have two cycles. One is the biological cycle, and we talked about this back in our life cycle uh, webinar. The biological cycle you can see on the right there. Um, and the technical cycle is the um, is the product life cycle, where we we're manufacturing products, uh, we use those products, we dispose of them or or recycle them, and uh, hopefully we recycle as much as we can to provide a nutrient to the manufacturing system again. That's basically the technological cycle. Um, but the problem is this. Um, 
this cradle to grave process is totally unsustainable. We are pulling materials from the biological cycle at an alarming rate, and we're also contaminating the biological cycle at an alarming rate as well. I mean, just think of the city of New York City. There's 13 and a half million people there that use products every day and dispose of products every day. So the cradle to cradle, cradle to cradle um, paradigm uh, in that is um, the concept of eliminating waste completely. Design things with an understanding that waste does not exist. We want to minimize consumption uh, from the biological cycle and safely return materials to the biological cycle if we can. Fourthly, we want to be able to keep materials within the technological cycle. If we can keep the material within the technological cycle, then they're really not a contaminant. And we want to minimize impact of the technological cycle on the biological cycle at all life cycle stages. This is just a quick gra uh, graphic to show the technical cycle where you can see on the left um, the supplier supplying uh, materials to the manufacturing um, uh, company or the manufacturing cycle, providing products to the customer use, and then end of life um, up here at the top. Um, we show it in this sort of counterclockwise fashion because this really um, mirrors what would be in a um, a, sist a value stream map. Value stream map, you have a supplier typically on the left and you have your manufacturing operations um, on the bottom and delivering uh, product to a customer on the right hand side. So that's why I showed it in this sort of counterclockwise fashion. You can see materials extraction here and the use of renewable materials whenever we can. Um, life so I'll just touch on this real quickly and I want to try to um, turn things over to Dr. Jawa. Uh, Dr. Jawa here, but the um, <clears throat> concept of life cycle management is very important and um, so we want to be able to look at the uh, various life cycle stages which we show across the top here, materials acquisition, product design, manufacturing, customer use and disposal, and then look at the impact areas, environment, energy, materials, health and safety, um, representing all three legs of the triple bottom line. And it's important for us as manufacturers to be able to evaluate our products uh, in all of these impact areas and at all of the uh, life cycle stages and to assess um, the impact of our products um, at these five life cycle stages. This can be done individually or this tool here can be used as a group to evaluate um, our products. And lastly, I have a, a just a quote of a uh, from a paper that was written by Dr. Jawa here and uh, uh, Bradley. Um, this is in 2016, uh, Technological Elements of Circular Economy and the Principles of 6R Based Closed Loop Material Flow in Sustainable Manufacturing. And this is an interesting quote. Um, we're envisioning a future where nothing is wasted, a future where every waste becomes an asset, and a future where all products at the end of their primary use are recovered and either reused, remanufactured, or recycled for multiple generations. And I believe Dr. Jawa here will be um, providing more detail in, this, um, in his uh, talk. So I'd like to take just a brief minute for a few questions. And if there are any, otherwise we'll, we'll move forward. Okay, thank you, Mark. And it really helps for those who've been following along to, to re, rethink about you know, where we're headed in this series and some of the foundational information. And for anyone joining us here for the first time, to let you know um, you're not necessarily just coming in the middle of something you cannot uh, find further information about. So. Um, that was a good basic introduction, and at this time we have no questions, so I would like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Jawa here for his presentation on sustainable product development. 
Good morning, everyone. So I'm extremely privileged to be in the company of two people, Lisa and Mark, uh, to, to, to give some, some of our recent developments in this area. So my presentation is going to focus on sustainable product development, but before I get to the exact topic, I need to give a little bit of uh, background here. My background slide always, uh, I use this slide um, to begin with the, the multiple uh, crisis situation that we have as global challenge to society, environment, and economy. This is not a, a news for us. This is very well known to us. Put together all in one slide. You see how horrific it is. It is water pollution you have, air pollution, landfills, waste, CO2 emissions, global temperature is increasing, as well as uh, the ecological footprint uh, is uh, getting larger and larger and unbearable with world population reaching 10 billion by the year 2050. So we have too little to be shared by too many. I mean, so many problems. So sustainability is not to be one of the solutions, one of the major solutions, but sustainability is not everything though. So we need uh, much more than sustainability political goodwill and climate and support and resources and all this we need. Now, if you look at sustainability as a resource, uh, in the global perspective, when the footprint goes higher and higher, we are beginning to feel that we are living in a junk world. Anything and everything that's being produced is being dumped and wasted, and there's hardly any recovery from the waste. So. There was a recent report I was shocked to see from Ellen MacArthur Foundation from England, and uh, which uh, made me to realign my thinking. I was thinking that uh, much of the plastic that um, that's being produced in the world can be recycled. And in fact, um, I, I have used for many, many years uh, the statistic that was published about uh, 10 or 12 years ago. 15 to 70 percent of the plastic can be recycled. I was um, made to believe that uh, after seeing this uh, report and interview from Elaine MacArthur Foundation, uh, in my, my data is not right. It is only 4 to 5 percent of the plastic is being recycled. 94 to 95 percent of the plastic is being dumped. And in fact, I saw a news also yesterday in, uh, off the coast of Australia, a large whale was um, kind of a found dead. In the body of that whale, they found 64 pounds of plastic waste. So, Ellen MacArthur Foundation says that if we let this continue, by the year 2050, in the oceans uh, where we get seafood from, it's going to have more plastic than fish. That's very scary, isn't it? So, something has to be done to turn this into, uh, to turn this plastic waste into something usable. So that's one thinking. It's not just plastic. Manufacturing waste, if you look at my previous slide, let me go back uh, momentarily. Look at the landfill and waste. There are about 15 different categories of waste there. A lot of the waste comes from manufacturing and domestic use. You know, a household uh, 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 use of uh, material being dumped into the waste is very large. So if you see the next one, next slide, it's a little uh, difficult to see. The landfill, I have reproduced this one. Some of the products that go, goes into landfill can be plastic soda bottles, glass bottles, batteries, aluminum, metal tin cans, plastic bags, plastic coated milk carton. You see a lot of plastics here, and orange peels, banana peels, paper, and other things. And you see some of the plastic soda bottles takes forever to decompose. Glass bottle takes one million years to decompose. Batteries, 100 years, not speaking of the toxic harm that has already caused. And of course, the good news is that uh, papers and, and paper products and orange peels and banana peels takes only a few months. That's not too bad. If you look at the top graph here, the waste generated by the household, it was, of, of course, a, a little older uh, data. But I think if you look at the new data, it's, it's more scary than this one. On an average, in an American household, about five pounds of waste being dumped into the landfill per day by person, by, by each person. So this is scary. I think much of it is not recycled. I think 95% of them is not recycled. Now this is the, the diagram that is close to our heart. I know Mark uh, presented very nicely showing the biological cycle and the technological cycle. I think the current practice what we have is take anything that's possible from the ecosystem, manufacture or make products and use them and dispose them indiscriminately. 
and a lot of them go to landfill. And the circular economy concepts that was introduced in the early 90s, particularly it's very strong in Europe, and it was actually introduced by two researchers in England, in the, in the United Kingdom. They showed that um, there is a possibility to turn the trash into treasure. So it is also well said by uh, a statement that I picked here. Today's goods are tomorrow's resources at yesterday's prices. That's the world that we are moving into. If we get the biological cycle and the technological cycle to kick in, and we can make this happen, we can make the material to flow into a perpetual, near perpetual cycle, where anything and everything that's being used and, and residually collected can be reused and remanufactured and recycled. And the emphasis, emphasis here is that is, uh, we need to look at life cycle as four major stages. First stage is uh, extraction of materials. Second stage is manufacturing the product. Second one is uh, using, which is the largest one. And uh, I'll go back to this again. And the post-use, which is the most problematic stage. At the end of life, what do we do with the products? That's where lots and lots of disasters take place. So for convenience, I've used it uh, more like a quadrant. If you look at the real scenario, real scenario is that from the ecosystem, when you get this full cycle to move in, extracting materials, processing the material, manufacturing, using, and retirement, and post treatment. We are taking too much of raw materials and energy and other resources and putting in also human resources there to produce products. And at the end, we're putting back into the ecosystem too much of waste and too much of emissions and too much of troubles come from that. So this, this situation is not sustainable. This uh, particular diagram we developed for a conference uh, paper 12 years ago in Europe. That's where we presented this uh, six R concept. The six R concept is essentially to go from lean to green to sustainable. The one R to three R to six R. I'm going to show it systematically here. How we can change this situation is by building from the reduce concept, which is a lean concept, by making it green concept. Reduce, reuse, recycle. These are the three R's that are foundational for green manufacturing. From there, we have to add three more R's. The three more R's are to recover end-of-life products and materials and redesigning the next generation products and processes that can use the residual materials and resources left from the previous generation mm -hmm. and remanufacturing. Then putting the remanufactured product into the cycle. What we are trying to do here is we are siphoning out the unsustainable system loop into a closed loop, 6R based, system where end of life products can be reused and remanufactured. So this is a this is a conceptually very powerful philosophy and is being also partially implemented by a number of companies and more and more companies are signing into. I tell you why we have to go into lean to green to sustainable manufacturing. If you look at the historical perspective, for good reason I have started the history from nineteen eighty. That's when the green that's when the lean revolution started from the traditional manufacturing, which goes uh, uh, in a progressive direction. And the lean concept uh, introduced uh, in the 80s, and particularly the practice uh, practice came out in the 90s, uh, uh, believed in the continuous improvement, step-by-step -step improvement. That's what is shown here in this uh, uh, colored line, steel line. And then came the green concept also in the late 90s uh, to em embrace the three R's. And some of us really believe the 6R concept fall from the heaven, as you see here. The 6R added by the three additional R's, recover, redesign, and remanufacture. The top three uh, uh, the statements here, they are very, very powerful. This is what's going to make uh, the world to be much more sustainable. With this, I'm going to show you the closed loop material flow with multiple life cycles in a kind of a nice illustration to show the first life cycle. From the ecosystem, we extract the materials and process the materials, make them raw mater as raw materials. The raw materials are being used in manufacture. Manufactured products are components are being assembled and made into products. In this case, the big product here, what we see is an airplane. And this is all non-story. This is what has been happening for probably 200 plus years in the history of human civilization. Now, what's less known is the recovery. Recovery is the first necessary hub. From the recovery begins multiple closed loops. 
starting with reuse, which gives a highest economic return. Then comes with uh, remanufacturing, then recycling and redesigning next generation products. Of course, reduce is blended in all four life cycle stages. With this, I need to give you a little bit of a background on sustainable manufacturing before I go to product development. Product development is the crown in the jewel here. I'm going to come down to that in sufficient detail. Sustainable manufacturing was a concept that was introduced in the early, uh, uh, I think, uh, 2002, 2003 time frame. About 16, 17 years, this uh, term has been um, used and sometimes abused. And U.S. Department of Commerce uh, came up with a nice uh, three lines statement, which you can still see on their website, which is somewhat uh, ineffective, I would say, then multiple organizations have come to exist with the slogan of sustainable manufacturing by way of making their roadmaps and strategic plans and, and path forward and things like that. Two documents that I'm showing here are two well-known documents uh, which are very, very, very well cited in the literature. American Society of Mechanical Engineering document came out, first one came out in 2011, the other one is 2014, to show the importance of sustainable products and processes. I, I personally happen to be the chairman of uh, the committee that uh, started this initiative called Research Committee on Sustainable Products and Processes. It was a passion for me at that time. Between 2005 and 2013, uh, 2014 actually, I was a chairman for this group for a long time. And we put together two workshops. Both workshops were held in Washington, D.C. These are the reports. Anyone who wants to have a copy of this uh, report, please send me an email or send Mark an email. I'll be glad to provide these copies. And of course, uh, the, the definitions have gone a long way up to 2014, where we, our institute had a, a national road mapping workshop here at the University of Kentucky that was funded by NIST, National Institute for, of Standards and Technology. And we had about 45 uh, industry experts, agency experts, and academics uh, coming together for two and a half days, and we came up with a nice uh, definition. Much of the earlier definitions um, uh, so nice things in the sense uh, we have a way of producing functionally superior products using novel, innovative, sustainable technologies and manufacturing methods uh, through the coordination of capabilities across the total or entire supply chain, not just the process chain as being believed. But one of the problems that we had was the stakeholder value. Sustainable value creation for all, all stakeholders was not understood very well. The last definition that we came up with is this. This definition has five elements. We look at product process and system level. Remember, product is the first necessary step. You need to be able to produce products. These products had to be produced using processes that are sustainable. Also, we need to have the system enterprise uh, infrastructure to provide this support. The five elements that we came up with at this 2014 workshop are, of course, it's cited as uh, the last one. It's derived from 2009 to 2010 to 2014. Primary it has to demonstrate reduced negative environmental impact. Products and process and systems have to demonstrate that. Then. It has to offer energy and resource efficiency, including materials and water and things like that, even human resources. And third one is to produce minimum quantity of waste. Of course, the operational safety and personal health has to be assured. All of this has to happen without compromising the product or process quality by providing the overall life cycle cost benefit. It, it looks very complex, but I think when you go deeper into it, it's not very complex at all. They're all intermingled together. Any product or process being designed or developed will have to have some of these elements to reflect sustainability content. So expectations here is the multiple here. Expectations are multiple here. Reducing energy consumption, reducing waste, reducing material utilization, it goes on like this. All of this is in the slide here. You will have access to it. When your company or your organization has one or two or more of these elements, being mandated, being uh, being aimed at. I think you are in the ballpark. The more you are getting into, the more you are becoming sustainable operations. Now I give you six major reasons why companies have to embrace sustainable manufacturing, including product and process and system level innovation. Primarily economic case. It's not very difficult to realize that sustainable products with a closed loop manufacturing can 
significantly enhance your economic gains. Also, companies and organizations have social commitment or societal commitment to their community and stakeholders. Third one is uh, some form of compliance with the regulatory requirements uh, using sheer resources and, and emitting uh, fewer emissions and hazardous chemicals being used. Then, of course, the uh, consumers of today are becoming smarter and, and uh, much more educated, and they are meeting the growing consumer expectations. Of course, there is also uh, a promotional aspect here, awards and awards uh, and media attention being provided for sustainable practices. So you get into the limelight when you practice sustainable manufacturing. There is uh, one other hidden aspect that is uh, hardly noticed is uh, adequately trained and educated graduates from colleges and universities can be hired by companies to go into the next century manufacturing. And we are essentially looking at sustainable manufacturing consist consisting of three integral elements, inseparable integral elements, products, processes, and systems. If any one of these elements is missing, there is no manufacturing as a whole. So the complexity here is that these three are in interrelated. You cannot individually looking at uh, products. You, can, you cannot produce sustainable products without sustainable processes. That's what I'm trying to say. There are multiple, uh, now I'm coming down to the sustainable product, which is the topic of this uh, seminar, next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to present with several slides. Beginning with definitions. There are again multiple definitions, it's never ending definitions. Companies and organizations, they come up with their own definitions. If you look at the picture on the right hand side, with the global warming and Dow, in, Dow Jones index have a kind of a group called sustainability index. Also some of the uh, global uh, human health environmental organization primarily focusing on uh, ecological aspect have sustainable product mandate. Also, also societal welfare is being looked at. All of this is being considered. The first definition covers all of this very nicely in an extended form to say products that fulfill the needs of the consumers without compromising its performance and satisfying the environmental, societal and economic regulations of its entire life cycle. And there means all four life cycle stages. There are two other definitions that emerge subsequently. The second one is um, uh, sustainable products that are those products providing environmental, social, and economic benefits while protecting public health, welfare, environment over their full commercial cycle from the extraction of raw materials to the final di disposition. The third one is much more compact, very simple, overly simplistic, I would say. Is sustainable products are products which are fully compatible with nature throughout the entire life cycle. This is where the circular economy concept that Mark presented and I also presented in one of the slides show the biological and technological cycle kicks in. So we don't have to really go on debating these um, definitions. I think uh, the message is the same. And uh, a little more expanded uh, explanation came in terms of sustainable product requirement, not necessarily as definition, but as requirements, what would a consumer of today or a stakeholder of today expect as a sustainable product is to have essentially, originally they came up with three, cyclic, solar, and safety. If you look at the diagram on the right, it's uh, drawn more like a cube, three axis, one axis representing cyclic nature, which is a, a reusable, recyclable nature. The other one is a safety aspect, including also health to some extent. Third one is the use of a renewable source of energy. Solar is shown as a, as a particular source, but it doesn't have to be limited to solar. It can be wind energy, it can be geothermal, it can be any other source. When you look at these three axis diagram, the, 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 the top um, right-hand corner, by compatible, 100% by compatibility you can achieve by satisfying cyclic nature, renewable nature, and the safety and health well-being. Well and later they also added uh, in, in a never, in, uh, never uh, stopping uh, efficiency improve, improvement and societal well-being. Uh, they came up with the two other additional requirement, efficiency as well as societal requirement. This is all well publicized in a nice uh, booklet that you can actually download from the website BioThinking International. And it's a 90 or 100 page uh, booklet, uh, lots of lots of stuff. I extracted that from there. So the 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 essential message, the 
single message that I want to give before I start substantially is designing for sustainability, developing or planning for sustainability is the key here. After the product blueprints, uh, product design blueprints go to the manufacturing level is too early. I think too late actually. We, we need to have the early thinking of designing the product for sustainability. It is a systematic approach. What we do here is we are systematically evaluating and mitigating the environmental, societal and economic concerns at the earlier stages of the process, product and process design. You know, there is a, an emerging technology that's also known to us from the early 90s called concurrent engineering. Product and processes can be designed concurrently. So what I mean here is that designing of products and processes can be done concurrently at the very early stage. Design for sustainability also gives an opportunity to optimize the balance between the, the three elements, three essential elements of sustainability, environment, economy, and society for product design. And we also very strongly believe that design is the key intervention point for making radical improvements, significant improvement in the sustainable performance of products throughout their life, life cycle. And also the byproducts that come from the product manufacture that can be captured and reused or recycled. And all new products need to be redesigned in a sustainable way. I would say one step further in a sustainable way when I say sustainable manufacturing technology set we employ to produce sustainable manufactured product. And also existing or current designs also need significant revisions. There's a need for sustainable products. If you look at the range of products that we have, the first one is a jargon of things that we can collect. Uh, actually, I, ask, I challenge my graduate students to come up with manufactured products around them. Within 30 minutes, they collected all these products and showed me the first dial, first one that you see on the top left turn corner. Automotive wheel to stapler and floppy drives and tapes and remote controls and, and video screens and things like that. Look at a big uh, monster like a uh, sports uh, car or an airplane, or a train, or a ship. These are products, assembled products, with uh, hundreds of thousands of components assembled in sub-assemblies and sub-assemblies integrated together to make the big product. Are they sustainable? I think we are judging very, on a macro level, uh, uh, by, by using technology, say electric cars, for example, or hybrid cars are much more sustainable than the usual. Yes, there is a truth to that. But if you go deep down into a car, a car will have typically 3,000 plus components. The question here is, if each and every component that goes into a car is made sustainable, that's a question. Because this car has this assembly of these components coming from different suppliers, different suppliers, different countries, different uh, uh, segments. So the premise here is that each component that goes into a product big product like car or airplane or ship or train can be made sustainable. So this is where the opportunity that sustainable products that can be made can be economically uh, advantageous. And one example I will give you here, the comparison between the Dreamliner 787 that uh, came into existence very recently, Boeing 787. Comparison is made with the previous generation 777 that uh, came to exist sometime in the mid-90s. I remember seeing this 777 being assembled on the sh on the shop floor at Boeing in the mid 90s when I went for a conference I visited Boeing. So there I was I was shocked to hear from them that there are about uh, 1 million rivets being used in that 777. I asked them why 1 million? Why not 900,000? Why not 800,000? And there's some magic number that came up with because because it's needed. Sometimes the components and products are over-designed. Maybe there's a safety requirement. I, I take that. But the fact that I'm going to present here is the material content in, in between the two designs. You see, in contrast to the old design, which is 777, it used only 12% composite. Now, the new one, 787, has 50% composite in its body for lightweight. It's a sustainable way of producing. It is not totally sustainable, I'm going to tell you the why. And originally they had, in 77, 50% aluminum. Aluminum content is now somewhat reduced to 20%. Why I say composite is sustainable and also not sustainable? It's sustainable in terms of its lightweight content, light 
great nature. It's not sustainable because the, the, the end of life is not yet faced by companies and users and stakeholders. How well we can recycle or reuse or remanufacture or break this apart and, 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 and make it a useful next generation product is not well known. Automotive companies like uh, Airbus and Boeing and others are spending millions of dollars in doing research in this. I'm sure they will come up with some good solution. The fact is that uh, a lot of the manufacturer, manufacturers jump to make sustainable products with no consequence of end of life. So end of life has to be considered at the design stage. That's a, that's a message I'm trying to give. The hundreds of thousands of millions of components going into each product that we have everyday use and we need to have in mind the end of life. And now we look at, uh, in particular, the auto body. Aluminum has been in use, growing use, and aluminum, of course, magnesium alloys, titanium alloys are coming into use and reducing the weight is the only concern. And manufacturability is one of the issues. Designing is one of the issues. Body, body parts, actually. Auto body, for example, they call body in white. Uh, the, 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 Alcoa company and uh, Audi uh, struck a deal sometime in the 90s to make aluminum auto body. There are lots of studies, and we happen to be one of those uh, groups that did some early studies uh, 10 years later to compare the steel auto body with uh, aluminum auto body. We found that uh, aluminum is lighter and, and much more sustainable, but manufacturability is not very easy. The life cycle overall cost in terms of uh, gas usage as well as emissions toxic emissions including CO2, aluminum is far superior to steel. And also the other fact that we learned was uh, aluminum is uh, multiple times recyclable without uh, deteriorating or losing its original property. Steel can be recycled very easily. A lot of the body white, uh, body in white steel can be recycled, but uh, after three, four, five times, it loses the original property. You need to add more alloys to bring back the original value. So aluminum is much more recyclable compared to steel. So these are some of the issues. We need to look at the totality of the whole issues. We looked at four life cycles. We had a few students working on it. We wrote some papers. Anyone who has interest to see our papers will be glad to provide those papers. We had a detailed study of uh, CO2 emission as well as cost to show at the product development stage, if you can compare aluminum with steel, we can give significant economic gain and also significant environmental benefits by using aluminum motor body. So going into my um, earlier statement that uh, design for sustainability is the essential part of any product development. Our original work, early work, about 13, 14 years ago, came up with six different elements. We called it elements. We didn't even call it metrics or measures or anything. First one is the environmental impact. It has sub-elements, like cycle factors, environmental factors, and things like that. Then came the recyclability and remanufacturability aspect, including disassembly and recovery and things like that. Then the third element that we added there was the societal impact, health and well-being, operational safety, ethical responsibility, and things like that. Then comes the functionality. Once the product is uh, manufactured, put to use, service life, maintenance, e modularity, ease of use, and, and upgradability, ergonomic aspect, functional effectiveness, all these come to play. And the fifth one is uh, manufacturability, the ability, ability to manufacture, and, and manufacturing methods come to play, packaging, assembly, storage, transportation, all that comes to play. Then, of course, the last one, not the least, is the uh, economic, economic aspect of manufacturing, energy efficiency, resource efficiency, material utilization, and things like that. The six elements and sub-elements put together formed our sustainability deal. This is the work that we introduced, I think, uh, first time in 2004-2005. So this was the foundational work uh, later became the metrics. And uh, by the year 2010, I think uh, our university group got a large project from NIST to study the metrics, to study the parameters that affect products and processes at high level. If you look at this uh, diagram here, there are multiple organizations coming up with uh, measures and methodologies like global reporting initiative, life cycle assessment, and Ford Motor Company's uh, product sustainability index and Dow Jones sustainability index. All of them come, come at different levels. It's all scattered. If you look at the techni technical details uh, from low to medium to high, 
Miss wanted us to look at that high level of products and processes particularly. When you move from product to process to facility to cooperation sector world and, and global level, to come at the early level, product and process level, at high level of technical detail to come up with metrics. We got money to develop metrics, one and a half million dollars for three years. I think we ended up in working for more than four years, continued with several students. So in that study, particularly for products, I'm showing only one small part of it. Product metrics we established by looking at product clusters. We looked at uh, clusters in terms of the three elements of sustainability, economy, environment, and society. For each of the elements, we came up with clusters. But you see in the green box here, 13 different clusters, three for economic aspect, five for environment, and five for societal aspect, 13 all three, the 13 clusters we came up with. Then the next level was to go under each cluster to identify metrics and measures, how we can quantify these variability uh, content of a product. So we came up with a total of 90 plus, I think 93 or 94 metrics. As a detailed study, I'm just showing a summary of how we can quantify the sustainability content, content of a product. And these uh, 13 clusters put together, came up with the mathematical foundation we developed uh, uh, to, to go into finally developing product sustainability index, Prod C. It's a long process. The mathematical foundation comes from identification of these 93, 94 metrics and arranging them into subclusters and then into clusters and developing sub-index for each one of them. Sub-index means one sub-index for society, one for economy, one for environment. Then all put together, uh, integrated together forms a product sustainability index. Because of the time constraint, I'm not showing all of this. If anyone wants to know more detail, we'll be glad to give our publications to you. And then more recently, what we did was also these uh, 13 clusters, we tried to find the cross-link between the six R's. Six R's we have, reduce, reuse, recycle, cover, redesign, and remanufacture. See, the, the cross-links uh, are shown here as effective if any anyone wants to locally apply these six R's for any particular aspect. And uh, these studies were actually completed very nicely and um, and we were fortunate to have three large companies coming to it, uh, coming together to help us to to apply this for their products. Crankshaft was chosen from Toyota, an automotive company, and fan blades were selected from General Electric Aviation from their aircraft engine, and uh, toner cartridge was selected as a product from a consumer product uh, uh, company Lexmark. So we applied our metrics based methodologies, it worked very nicely, and in fact, uh, the company appreciated very much what we did for them to look at the sustainability content of these products. And of course, they are using the methodology for different aspects, uh, uh, even after we completed the project. Now, uh, I'm coming to pretty close the end of my presentation to show that there are two innovation aspects, two important uh, innovation activities uh, that we need to consider up front before we develop sustainable product. One is the material. We need to look at the materials capability. The material has to be modular, microstructure, nanostructure levels. We need to look at, you know, the sustainability begins at the microstructure, nanostructure level. The recyclability is already decide, decided. Just like the gene of a baby that's being in the womb of a mother being developed. The brain development comes uh, subsequently, but the, the embry embryonic uh, development starts very early. So that embryonic development starts with microstructural aspect of studies of the products that we are trying to uh, make and what materials that we have to use. We have to engineer the materials. We have to re-engineer sometimes surfaces and subsurfaces to enhance, enhance your product sustainability, maintainability, recyclability, and things like that. That's a material aspect. The second aspect is there is a need for significant design innovation to, to keep in mind the uh, ever-increasing uh, product quality life, performance, maintenance, and environmental impact, societal impact at the end of life. And also we need to keep in mind the reduced uh, resource re utilization, for example, energy, water, and human resources as well. Also assuring the operational safety and health concerns, addressing the health concerns. The last thing, but not the least, is the cost effectiveness. All of this has to happen at a cost. And the real optimization comes by putting in all the 
product requirements scale the cost. And the last slide that I have is uh, some of the labeling, some of the standards and labeling systems that are known to us for various products like clean vehicles, forest uh, products, lease certification, lease certification for building products, and also Scandinavian countries say Nordic Swan Eco labels and uh, life cycle assessment methodologies. European Union has eco label system. And for, uh, for appliances and things like that, here in the US, we have the energy stars. And this kind of labels are emerging very regularly. They are very specific, uh, very segment based or custom based for different product segments. Uh, I'm not saying that there are conflicts there. There are obviously some conflicts, uh, but uh, these conflicts are minor compared to the benefits. What we need to do is we need to try to make sure that the products that are being designed and manufactured are in compliance with some of these uh, standards and regulations, while it can also provide societal, environmental, economic benefits. So that's all I have here, Mark, and this is my last slide. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Jawahar. And um, we did receive one question. Where can we find more information on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index? Oh, it's a publish. Uh, I think you can Google it and find it. And um, I, I think it's a big, it's an economic return um, indicator. I think it's developed originally by economists, not so much by engineers or scientists. And I think they understood uh, very quickly that uh, you need some technological input there. I think Dow Jones uh, has a group of experts who continuously update this data. And it also carries forward for their economic uh, indicators, predictions, as well as uh, daily fluctuating markets. I think if you, if you can Google it and find it, and there are some documents, if anybody wants, I can uh, happily find it for them and send it to them. Okay, thank you. I may have some in my collection, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, and I think that question leads to uh, the overcompassing part of your uh, presentation is this is, you know, this is a business decision. Um, this this isn't just about doing something good for the environment. Um, it It's really, um, you know, there's a foundation that it has an economic impact on your business. Yeah. And I like that you closed with the labels because okay. that is a, you know, it, there's a lot of information that we're providing through this initiative, and I, this is why we keep trying to break it down independently. Is it is, uh, uh, you know, it can be to very convoluted, um, but if you have an end set in mind, if you have some sort of um, accreditation or, or labeling or something that you want to go after, that helps to set your path, and then that on the opposite side helps to uh, be a public indicator of of what you're doing. So yeah, Lisa, that's a very good point. Let me add on to that. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, there is a conflict here. Very often uh, companies, particularly small, com small to medium companies, uh, tend to think regulations are uh, detrimental to their progress. They think regulations are prescriptive. And uh, they think regulations are detrimental to innovation. Uh, my belief and my observation uh, worldwide uh, also in many small to medium and large companies is that uh, regulations, which is uh, kind of a perceived to be prescriptive approach, and goes hand in hand with innovation. Small companies take and can take advantage of innovation to make to gain significant economic uh, benefits. At the same time, they can also be compliant with uh, some of the regulations to increase their market share. Am I making the point here? Yes, exactly. Making that connection. Mm -hmm. So, um, thank you once again. That's the end of our questions. And that brings us to the conclusion of the session. And I, I do want to say again, uh, Dr. Jawahar, I think your slides, your graphics, uh, help to bring it back down to some basics. Um, because that's, you know, those are basic concepts that hopefully can help uh, those who are company representatives make the case internally as they try to incorporate sustainable um, concepts. What we can also do is, uh, Lisa, as we talked last time, uh, if any company wants any more advanced knowledge, uh, we can provide them that knowledge by way of uh, providing some form of advice or 
consulting opportunities as well as short courses if anybody wants a uh, dedicated one between KP, KPPC and our institute. Yes. Will be, this is our mandate actually, some kind of a technology transfer, knowledge transmission, we can do that. Exactly. That's what we're here for. And just so people know, you know, don't forget if you don't know where to start and you're just kind of overwhelmed um, or you have a direct line you want to, uh, path you want to go down, uh, feel free yeah. to call us. That's what, exactly. That's what we're here for. And uh, we, can, we can help you at any stage. I would suggest uh, making a first contact with us here at KPPC, and Mark has, has given his um, contact info, and then we can help to uh, coordinate among other partners in the group, and, and if we feel like you need to go, uh, you know, talk with uh, Dr. Jawahar's group or, you know, where you need to go, but it would be a good starting, we would certainly help uh, get you started and, and identify what your needs are. And with that, that ends our webinar session and thank you for joining us and have a good afternoon.